we said in the first lecture that the normal distribution plays a central role in any sort of hypothesis test and that hypothesis tests were how we checked inferences. Now we want to go into the details of how the normal distribution is actually used. And so, as we said, you know, it's used practically in all aspects of inference. When we do chi-squared tests to determine if a random variable comes from a specific type of distribution, or if we want to deter determine if two random variables are related, then we use a thing called the chi-squared test of association. It, it comes in there. And again, the, the, the normal is related to the chi-squared because the square of standard normals when they're added is a chi-squared random variable. So that's the relationship to a normal. But it also comes in when we're looking at the distribution of estimators for parameters. We're going to see that the central limit theorem basically says that the distribution for the estimators are normal. And the rationale or the reason for that is going to be the central limit theorem. So distribution of estimators for parameters are generally normal. But we're also going to be analyzing error terms in models. When we set up models, we have to make sure um, that the error terms satisfy a number of conditions. And one of those conditions are that the errors have to be normally distributed. And so, of course, normal distribution plays a central role because we have to check and see if the errors follow a normal distribution. And finally, hypothesis testing, which we're going to talk about later. We're going to see um, through the central limit theorem how hypothesis testing uses the normal distribution. Okay, so there are three properties of the normal distribution probability density function that are very important. And you're probably very familiar um, with the shape of a normal distribution. It's centered around the mean, which we generally denote by mu, okay, Greek letter for M. And the first property is that the area under this entire curve has to be unity. Why is that? Well, what is this curve? It's a probability density function. How do I find the area under the curve? Well, I integrate the probability density function from negative infinity to infinity, and I know that the definition of a probability density function is that that integral has to be equal to 1. Okay, That's a very important um, fact. The second is that the curve is symmetric about the mean. Okay. And again, that plays a very vital role when we're working with a normal distribution. And here, symmetric means that if I took a knife and I cut along that line, x equal to mu, I could take those two halves and superimpose it, and they'd be exactly the same. They'd fit right into each other, right? So that's what, that's what symmetry means, OK? Um, the last is that the curve is bell-shaped. And there's an important consequence that, of that. It's called the empirical rule. And what I want you to notice is that the further you get from the mean, okay, the less likely you are to be at that, at that position. Now remember, the PDF at a particular point is not equal to the probability. Okay? But we're going to see how we can express this in a rigorously correct way. But you should kind of get the notion that the further you are from the mean, the less likely you are to find values. Okay? further from the mean. And the empirical rule actually tells us the percentile of a value. And remember, the percentile tells you how likely that value is to occur based on the distance from the mean. And we're going to see how this works now. So what is the empirical rule? Well, here's the statement of the empirical rule. It says start off with a normal PDF centered at mu. And it says that if we look at all the values within one standard deviation, remember sigma here is the population standard deviation, we consider all the values within one standard deviation of mu, 68% of the population lie in this area, okay, in this, in this region. Okay, so 68% of the values in a normal distribution are within one standard deviation of the mean. What happens if we look at two standard deviations? Well, now it turns out that 95% of this population 
has values that lie within two standard deviations of the mean. And finally, if we go to three standard deviations, it's 99.7. Okay, so basically all of the population, practically all of the population, lies within three standard deviations of the mean. Notice something very important about the empirical rule. It doesn't depend on what the values of mu and sigma are. It is a universal law. No matter what mu and no matter what sigma you have, the empirical rule is obeyed for every normal distribution. So to put that another way, what it says is that the likelihood of a value depends on how far it is from the mean in units of standard deviation. This is the practical significance of the empirical rule. Let me give you an example to show you how this actually works. People talk about the standard deviation as a unit of measurement or a measuring stick and I want to show you how this works. So let's consider you have two job offers. Okay. Uh, one job offer is from Tokyo. You're offered $100,000 and the other job offers in Cleveland, Ohio, where you're offered $100,000. Okay. Now you know that th these job offers, if we only consider money alone, they're really not equivalent, okay? So if we ask the question, which job offer is better? We know that $100,000 in Cleveland is not the same as $100,000 in Tokyo, okay? So how do we decide which is better? Well, we're interested really in not what our salary is, but in what our salary is relative to everyone else, okay? So the answer to this question is the salary that's in the higher percentile is going to be the better choice, okay? Now let's use the normal distribution to answer this question. Suppose you go online and you do your research and you find out that salaries in Tokyo are normally distributed the mean is 120 and the standard deviation is 20. So the normal distribution for the incomes looks like this, right? Notice that I'm, 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 I'm using units of standard deviation. Okay, this is my unit on, on the x-axis, right? 20. And you go online and you research Cleveland, the salaries there, and you find out that it's also normally distributed. But here the mean is 80 and the standard deviation is 10. So I center my curve at 80 and I step out in units of standard deviation. Now here's the question. Which value is better? Well, what we really want to do is we want to find out what percentile is $100,000 in here and what percentile is $100,000 in here. How do we answer that? Well, we notice that 100 is two standard, is, I'm sorry, is one standard deviation from the mean, okay? It's 20 away from the mean, so it's one standard deviation. And we know from the empirical rule that 68% of the values are within one standard deviation of the mean. We know that the entire curve has to add up to 100%. Okay? So there has to be 32% in these two tails. We also know that the curve is symmetric. So since these areas, since this region is the same distance from the mean as this region, these have to be the same. So they each have to be 16%. So notice that $100,000 lies in the 16th percentile. Okay. Here we're using the empirical rule along with the basic properties of the normal distribution. The whole the area under the whole curve has to be 100% and it has to be symmetric about the mean. Not very good. 16th percentile means 84% of the population sits above you, right? What about Cleveland? Well, let's look at 100. 100 is two standard deviations from the mean, right? Because the standard deviation here is 10. What does the empirical rule tell us about the percentage of values within two standard deviations of the mean? Well, it says 95% of the population is within two standard deviations from the mean. Again, the area under the whole curve has to add up to 100%. So 
so the area and these two tails have to add up to 5%. And due to symmetry, each of these therefore have to be 2.5%. Now notice 100% is here. 2.5% sit above it, so 97.5 sit below it. And therefore we're in the 97.5th percentile. So clearly, the Cleveland job offer based purely on monetary considerations is our best choice, right? Now I want you to think about something. Let's look at this example again. Okay, same, same distribution. But now let's suppose that Tokyo, instead of offering $100,000, offered one hundred and sixty. Okay, so you go to Tokyo and you say, I want, I want a salary that matches Cleveland in terms of a percentile. And they, they, they tell you, well, based on the distribution for Cleveland, we should pay you $160,000. Are they right? Well, let's see. Let's suppose, again, Cleveland still offers you $100,000. Are these two values in the same percentile? Well, let's see. 60 is two standard deviations away from the mean. And we know that 95% of the population is two standard deviations from the mean. And just like before, this has to be 2.5%. So this value lies in the 975 percentile. And we already went through this argument before and showed that this was in the 97.5th percentile. So yeah, these two salaries are now comparable, right? You sit in the same percentile. Now here's what I want you to notice. Notice that the percentile does not depend on the value of the random variable. Okay. It only depends on its sign distance from the mean sign distance meaning that you know two standard deviations below and two standard deviations above are very different right you'd rather be two standard deviations above than two standard deviations below so signed is referring to um, x minus mu the sign of x minus mu but the point is that the percentile for a given data of that value okay depends only on its sign distance from the mean in units of standard deviation right so if you tell me how far a data value is from the mean in units of standard deviation I can tell you the percentile so this suggests that we define a new random variable we're not really interested in X here are we we're interested really in the distance of x from the mean in units of standard deviation. So what would what would do that? Well, we'd have to subtract x from mu and divide by the standard deviation, right? And this creates a new variable. This is called the z-score. Okay? And notice what I say is true because if I compute the z-score for here, 160 minus 120 divided by 20, I get 2. Okay, so when z is equal to 2, I'm in a 97.5th percentile. But this is also a z-score of 2, right? So this shows us that it's the z-score that, 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 that determines the percentile. And the z-score only. It's not the mean and it's not the standard deviation. Okay? Because I take them out of the picture. I subtract off the mean. I divide by the standard deviation. It's only how far a value is from the mean in units of standard deviation that determines its percentile and the percentile tells us how likely a value is to occur. Okay, so a percentile is very important. Okay, how do we do this? Okay, what if, for example, we don't get a nice number? Notice that here everything was nice. The z scores, when the z scores are integers between minus three and three, the empirical rule can help us out, right? But what if the salary here had been a, a hundred and five? I couldn't use the empirical rule what would I do? Okay. Well, we're going to see that there's a table. We're going to be able to answer that in a second. But more important, a question we have to answer first is what is the distribution of the z-scores first? Let's, let's look at this first. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider a coordinate transformation from the data value to the z-scores. Okay. So here's my data value. Okay. Put me, I put the mean here. I'm stepping out in units of standard deviation. That looks right. Now I'm going to subtract off the mean. Okay, so mu now becomes zero, 
And these now all have units of standard deviation, right? Telling me how far away I am from zero in terms of standard deviations. Notice the distribution has not changed. All I've done at this point is I've shifted the distribution, right? Distribution has not changed. And finally, I'm going to divide by sigma. Okay. And so, although I'm not drawing this to scale, okay, this is drawn to scale. This is not. But nevertheless, I claim, and we can actually prove this because we did this coordinate transformation before. But I, I claim that this is still a normal distribution. Okay. Notice that z has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Okay. This this new random variable. And we actually showed this. Remember when we did this coordinate transformation with a normal distribution, we showed that this was true. Okay. And this particular random variable has a very important name. It's called the standard normal. Why is it called the standard normal? What is a standard? Okay, a standard is something that everything is compared to. If you say, for example, Michael Jordan is the standard to which all basketball players are compared, right? It means that Michael Jordan is the player that everyone else is compared to. Well, notice what the standard normal does. It takes any random variable, any normal random variable, and puts it in the same form. And so this is what lets us compare different normal distributions, just like we were able to compare those salaries from Tokyo and Cleveland, even though they were totally different normal distributions. If we take both of those distributions and compare it relative to the standard normal, then we can, then we can compare the two. Okay? So the standard normal is what every normal distribution is transformed to. It's the standard. It's the one that we go, everyone is put in terms of. Okay, so how do we now use the, 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 uh, the standard normal? Well, like we said, we, we, we know from the empirical rule that if the z score is an integer, we can find its percentile, but it's as true in general, okay? There are tables. Here's a kind of simple table, okay? Telling us if the z, telling, uh, telling us the z score out to the first decimal, what the, what the percentile is. Notice that zero is the fiftieth percentile. Okay. When I go to um, negative one, okay, I'm at this. I'm, I'm roughly at the sixteenth percentile. Okay. But what happens if we have minus two point five one eight? What do we do? Well, then we have to use some sort of computer program. And you can use whichever you want. There's tons of them. Okay. There's there are packages that will tell you this. In Excel, it's norm.dist. Okay, but you're probably going to use R or, or some sort of, you know, routine you write in C. And there are, there are packages to do this, okay. Uh, we can't determine. Remember what we said, the CDF for the normal distribution cannot be found analytically. It has to be done numerically, okay. All right. What sort of problems are we going to get with a normal distribution? Well, they take one of two forms. Okay, the first is where we're given a value from a normal distribution. We're told that it comes from a normal distribution. And we're also told the mean and the standard deviation. Okay, that's important. We have to know that it's from a normal distribution. And we have to know the mean and the standard deviation for that normal distribution. And if we do, then the first thing we can do is we can take a data value and find its percentile. And we've, we've, we've actually been been doing that, right? So how do we do that? Well, we take the data value, we compute its z-score, and then we go to a table or use a computational program and we find this percentile. Okay, This is what we've been doing. But notice we can go backwards also. Okay? If you give me the percentile, I can find the corresponding data value that in that population sits at that percentile. How do we do that? Well, we go backwards. Okay, We take the percentile and either from the table or a computer program we find out the z-score that gives us that percentile and then since we know the mean and the standard deviation we can basically solve this equation for the, for the data value and compute our data value. Okay. 
let's look at a sample problem here. Let's suppose our random variable is the weight of a cow in pounds. And let's suppose that the weight of a cow is a normal distribution. The mean is 900 and the standard deviation is 50. And so now let's ask the following question. If a cow weighs 925 pounds, what percentile is it in? Okay, so what do we do? We're going from a data value to a percentile, right? So we have to go through the z-score. Okay, so we go ahead, we take our data value, we compute the z-score, our data value is 925, subtract it from the mean of 900, divide it by the standard deviation of 50, and we get 0.5. We go to the table, and we find out this is in the 69.1st percentile, or we'll round it off to 69th percentile. Okay. So let's now go the other way. Suppose I tell you the percentile and I want to know the weight. So if I tell you a cow, a, a cow is in the first quartile or the 25th percentile, right? what is its weight? Well, we go backwards. We're going from percentile to data value. But notice we always have to go through the z-score. Right? He's the he's he's the middleman. No matter which way you go, this way or this way, you always have to go to the z-score. So first I'm going to start with a percentile. And here I'm going to actually use a computer program. So let's let's use Excel. I'll just show you in Excel how to do it very quickly. Um, I'm going to say I'm going to start with X, mu, sigma. Okay, and I'm going to start. Where I'm going to have percentile here. Okay, so I want the 25th percentile, so I'm going to have to put that in terms of a of a decimal. Mu is 900. This is 50. I'm going to compute the z-score. Okay. Um, let me delete this real quick. Okay, so the z-score is going to be equal to. Um, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to have to compute the z-score, sorry. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to say equal um, norm.dist. Um, actually, it's going to be norm. Dot, no, it's going to be this. Nope, norm.inv. I knew it was one or the other, sorry. Norm.inv. Okay, so this is the probability. This is this is this is computing the the inverse CDF, okay? So this is the probability in the left-hand tail. This is the mean. This is the standard deviation. Okay. And and I'm going to actually do I'm going to actually do the z-score first just to make it easier. Okay. And that's my z-score. Okay? And so now I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to compute the data value, which is going to be equal to mu, plus, and this tells me how many units of standard deviation I am away from the mean, right? Okay, and I end up getting 866.275. Here I used a table, I rounded it off, okay, but this is showing you how to do it a little more carefully. Okay. So this was using a table, which is only up out to the first decimal point. All right. So these are some homework problems I'm going to have you do. The first one, use only the empirical rule. And the other one, you're going to have to use a, a computer program. But these are good problems to start with, so you can kind of get a handle on how to work with a normal distribution.